Ready? He's got open man. DJ Moore. End zone. Touchdown. Touchdown, Bears. I am Jeff Joniak. Blitz is on. <laughs> Down he goes. Brisker. What was it like playing for Coach Dicka? Uh, I don't want to answer any questions like that. Pressure coming. He's in big trouble. Down he goes. No. Montez Sweat. No way. And ta-da, and ta-da, and ta-da. Now, Bears Etc. brought to you by Geico. With the voices of the Bears, Jeff Joniak and Tom Thayer. Well, it's a 4-2 and two start for our Bears after putting Jacksonville in a London fog, and it's a good start on a three-game winning streak with a week off and two road games coming up on the other side. We discuss with Super Bowl winning Bears guard Tom Thayer. I'm Jeff Joniak, and welcome to Episode 103 of the Bears Etc. Podcast. We're brought to you by Geico, our special guest. This week is Bears legend running back and the great Neil Anderson, number 57 on the all-time Bears 100 list. Uh, a guy with sprinter speed, 38 and a half vertical jump at Florida, finished second in the shot put in high school at a state meet and set a Florida record in rushing yards with over 3,200 in his career. In addition, at one point, the great Don Pearson of the Chicago Tribune wrote this about Neil Anderson. Neil Anderson, and this was September of 1990. Neil Anderson is the best running back in football. He's passed up Eric Dickerson and Roger Craig. Does more than Barry Sanders or Christian Okoye. More powerful than Thurman Thomas. Shiftier than Herschel Walker. Bigger than James Brooks. And faster than anyone with a possible exception of Bo Jackson. At age 25, he became the highest paid bear ever at that time. Four year, about $1.6 million annually and second in salary only to Dickerson among NFL running backs. What a career he had, Neil Anderson, our guest. Yes, I just talked to somebody, Neil. Oh, wow, you got Neil Anderson on the show. We loved you in Chicago. You look all yoked up, ready to go. I, I, I see about five carries in you. Outside zone, inside zone, or run up the middle behind Tom Thayer, Jay Hilgenberg, and Bortzi. How about that? Well, put me behind those guys, and I think I have a good chance. <laughs> How you feeling, man? I, we missed you in London. I know you were slated to go. What happened? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling great. Uh, unfortunately, the storm came through, the hurricane and uh, the Orlando airport was closed on Wednesday and Thursday, and I was scheduled to fly Thursday morning, and they were closed all day. So we ended up canceling the trip because we had a, a set date that we had to be back. So uh, unfortunately, we had, we had to cancel. But uh, there will be other, other opportunities, I hope. Everything's good. At, you know, some limbs and stuff down, a lot of cleanup to do um, for the, in the aftermath. But compared to a lot of people, yeah. I mean, we can out, uh, smelling like a rose. Um, my son lives in Tampa, and his power was out for about you know probably four or five days at least. And so he was he came and was staying with us. And uh, so a lot of people did, didn't do too well. You're one of the most unique guys I think I've ever played with in in my career because you had goals set, you had benchmarks that you were going to get to, and then you had what you wanted to accomplish out of football. So at this stage of your life, are you a football fan? Do you enjoy the sport or are you kind of a, a business person and a farmer and everything else that well, you got your hands into? The biggest thing and, and what I'm most proud of is at this stage, I'm just a dad. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I have three kids. Uh, one is um, at Florida Atlantic University. She plays volleyball there and uh, down in Boca Raton. And I have uh, an older daughter that's um, 23, and she's a first-year medical school student at uh, Wake Forest. Wow. And, and I have a son who <clears throat> lives in Tampa. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he's, um, he, he works. He's an accountant, and um, he works there. And so uh, I'm just checking in with them, and, and they, they're coming back to see us all the time. So that means we did something right because they love coming to visit. Uh, good for you. You know, Neil, it, when I talk about your uniqueness, so walking out of the locker room before a game started, I asked Walter Payton, I said, Walter, give me some words of inspiration. Why are you still so great? And he snapped his helmet. He said, because I'm not rich. And then one time I asked you, you told me in the locker room, and I don't even know if you remember this, you said, Tom, when I reach this bench, benchmark of finances, I'm, I'm going to be done with football. And I don't know if you remember that, but why were you so mature about that decision at such a young 
guy in your life and then you're a, a, a great business success right now? Well, you know, you, you hear some of the stories even before getting into the league, some of the horror stories about, you know, guys leaving the league, having made quite a bit of money and they leave it and they're pretty much broke. And so, you know, I didn't want to be in that statistic. And so I kind of had a plan that I wanted to play. At that time, the contracts were pretty much standard, four years. So I thought if I could play two contracts, you know, eight years was what I asked God to bless me with. If, if, if I could be a, play eight years and stay healthy, uh, that would be what I wanted to do. And, and I figured, you know, being a first-round pick, you're going you're gonna to make decent money. I mean, obviously. And so I had that first contract, and I thought, you know, and hoped that I would do well. And then I would have a, a big second contract. And then that should, you know, be able to I, hold hold me all off for, you know, to do other things as, as far as business and things like that. And and the plan, and again, I, I give credit to God because um, I, I was able to do well with the first contract being a first round pick and, you know, following linemen like yourself, it was, huh. it, it made life a little bit simpler. And, and then when I signed my second contract, I think at the time I was the highest paid Chicago bear player ever uh, at that time. And, and I think I was the uh, highest paid running back at that time. Now this, you know, this is when, you know, we weren't making quite as much money as they are now. I just looked it up too, Neil. Started a four year, six million you got, which was okay. one point six a year. And I just <laughs> the average salary now, like the, the Christian McCaskey's at sixteen million. I mean, listen, exactly. annually, annually, and and I get it. And Tom's, I mean, the guard, the guard numbers have gone way up. And you, but you guys, right. and I know Tom has said we've talked about this. Hey, does it ever bother you? And he absolutely no. not. It uh, how could it? You know, it, but I, I do. It doesn't bother me at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I tell people because some people ask that question often, and I really think that at that point in my life, I was not ready to have that kind of finances. That would have not been good, I don't think, for me. Hmm. Uh, so I think God knew what was what was best for me, and, and He took care of me and smiled on me, and <laughs> and I'm I'm very thankful about it. Have have no regrets. When you talk about being a first rounder, you were a first rounder as a running back, and that's where your future was in the NFL. But of anybody I've ever seen throughout the course of my history in the NFL, I've never seen a greater first round player special teamer like you were your first year. You are the most amazing flyer on the punt team that I, I, I've seen come across the Bears and along, and they have one right now in Josh Blackwell who does an unbelievable job. So when you look at the history of first-rounders and sometimes they feel a little bit entitled and they're not going to play special teams and they don't have that in their DNA, but that was a major part of your rookie year DNA. Why were you so great at that? before you became uh, all pro in your career? Well, I'll tell you, it's a funny story because I didn't realize that when I was given the opportunity to, to play on special teams, that I was supposed to act like I was entitled and that was beneath me. <laughs> and, and what happened is I went into Coach Dicker's office. Um, it wasn't quite midway through the year yet, but I wasn't playing. And I wanted to get on the field. And he told me, he said, I don't know if you realize, but we've got the greatest running back ever to play this game <clears throat> in front of you. And I say, like, okay, now, my next question was, so why am I not playing? I still didn't understand. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so he ended up saying, well, I tell you what, if you want to play, we'll put you on special teams. I was supposed to say no. That's what he thought. But I was thinking, like, okay, I'm going to get on the field. You know, my, my family, people I know from Florida, my hometown, they're going to be able to watch me. So I was like, okay. So I was put on special teams. I was supposed to be uh, the safety. So the kicker, kick it off, and I'm supposed to hang back. And in case anybody breaks through with my speed that I had, I could go get them. <laughs> well, we kick off 
that that first ball, and all of a sudden, I go down, and this hole, I see it opening up, like I'm a running back, but I don't have the ball. So I hit that hole, and fortunately, the runner comes coming through, and, and, I, and I hit him, and boom. Huh. And Dicker was yelling and screaming at me because I was supposed to be the safety. <laughs> Steve Kazar, that wasn't my job to go down and tackle the people. So I had never returned, and I had also never returned uh, any kicks in my in my career. That wasn't what what I did. I just played running back. I wasn't on special teams in college. Well, they got me back there to return a kick. The first kick that I was back to return, if I'm not mistaken, I, I knew how to run. So I now I just need to catch this ball, and I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it. I look it all the way in, and I catch it, and all of a sudden. This whistle blows. I'm on the one yard line. I got one foot inbounds, one foot out of bounds on the one yard line. So that's where we get the ball on the one. I get over to him and he has a few choice words and a, a few <laughs> curse words. And so they decided, okay, well, your job is going to be something simple. You just go get the man with the ball. So when we kick off, my job was one thing and one thing only, to go get the man with the ball. Wherever the ball was, to go get it. Because I guess he figured he could do that. He don't have to think too much. So so, so I did that, and it worked out, and, and it was fun. Just the, hearing the fans, you know, they had a, at one point during the season, they would be chanting my name when I'd go out there for the um, wow. for, for the punt team yeah. or the kickoff team. They would just be chanting. And, and then it was great having – you know, I'm on offense, but as soon as I make a tackle, the defense runs onto the field. They grab me, slap me on the head, and, <laughs> and I'm like, man, this is this is great. So and 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 I didn't have to make excuses about having a hurt ankle or whatever to my friends at home, because they'd be asking, I think, well, the fridge stepped on my foot at practice and I hurt my ankle. Uh-huh. I just make stuff up. <laughs> you know, because I I mean I'm on the, I, I was used to being on the field and and I couldn't let my boys down and tell them, well, they're just not playing me. You earn respect of every all three phases and the fan base on top of it. Hey, we're brought and to you was, by I PNC. Was on that kickoff return, by yeah. the way. We're we're brought to you by PNC, official bank of the Bears. You know, I don't know if they kept special teams tackles by individuals back then. I'm sure Kayser did. Do you know how many special teams tackles you had your rookie year? Because I don't. I- I, I have no idea. Was it was it was it double digits? Yes, it was double oh, digits because yeah. it was the most in the NFL yeah. at a flyer position. Wow! I was leading the league, and and you know, and, and the the I think when it was fun for me because at one game I lined up, I was out wide on the punt team. So same thing. My job is to go down and get them, and and one team lined up, and I don't know what who, what team it was, but they lined up. And put three people out there in front of me. Oh my I figured, goodness! I mean, I mean, I made it. I mean, I'm <laughs> yeah, right. Doing, I'm doing something right. They got three people, and on that play, I, I remember I got a penalty on that play because you know I really couldn't get away from all three of them. So I grabbed one guy's face mask and slammed him to the ground. And uh-huh. Then I was I, I was off and running. At one point, was number two all time in rushing on the Bears list. He's number three right now. Matt Forte passed you a few years back. 20 receiving touchdowns, 9.1 a catch, three seasons of 1,000-plus, four Pro Bowls, 116 games played. December 2nd, 1990, 50-yard game-winning touchdown on a pass from Jim Harbaugh against the Lions. You eliminated them from the playoffs, and you guys got in the playoffs. So now in all these years retrospectively, was that your your play you always remember? I, I always remember that play. Um, cause everybody was, you know, ran onto the field and, and, and they called me cuz at the time. Cause I was like, everybody's cousin, you know, <laughs> so they called me cuz and, they, and all I could hear is duck cuz, duck cuz. And I was on the ground and, 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 and Glenn Kozlowski was in my ear just yelling duck cuz, duck cuz. So that was a lot of fun. But, you know, I, the one more game I remember against the Packers, you know, um, we're going against them there at their place, and all of a sudden, I mean, this, this group behind our bench, I mean, they calling me all kind of names and saying stuff, and so in the heat of the battle, you know, I'm I'm hyped up, and 
So I walked back toward the back of, toward the back of the bench and kind of inviting one guy who's talking smack to, you know, come down here a little closer. You know, maybe we could we could meet. And settle this thing. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's all. It's, it's in a friendly way. And and it this kept going on and the, the policeman had asked if I would not do that. And I'm thinking, but this is I'm on the field. I mean, they yelling at me. And but the long story short, toward the end of the game, uh, I break a, a, a pretty big run, and that pretty much does it for that game. So, but I'm going when I get back to the bench, I go back there and I'm staring at them, and slowly they stood up and started to clap. And cause I did think they like hard nosed physical football. And me and Brian Noble had been pre- oh. going at it real hard because he was he was crazy, and I guess I was a little bit crazy. So <laughs> you know, and nobody was going to give when they stood up. I didn't know what to do. I mean, I'm like, do I do I cry? Do what? what I mean, what do you huh. do? Because I was ready for the, the complete opposite. But you know, and I felt good because that that was they gave me a lot of respect. They didn't like me. They made that very clear. <laughs> But they they respected, you know, uh, what I had what I had done and and what our team had done, you know, doing doing that game. So I, I I'll never forget that. You know, Neil, this is kind of a, the first part of a two part question. The first part, when you first got on the field, you were playing a little bit more fullback than you were playing halfback. Right. How much How much did you hate that? Um, I really didn't hate it. Uh, I I didn't want to do it very long, and I, I understood. Um. You know, I knew who Walter Payton was, you know, before I got there, just great, great player. And, you know, I think out of respect for him, you know, uh, Coach Dicker and Greg Landry, offensive coordinator, I mean, they, they, you know, somebody had done all that he had done. And what I understood, never complained about, I need to be on a different team. You know, we're not winning and I'm so great. But he was a Chicago Bear, and so, you know, I understood why why it happened, and, you know, and they didn't really at that time let us just compete to see who's going to get this job, you know. I mean, out of respect and for what he had done, you know, and, and we were winning, you know. Uh, my first year, you know, I got there, and, and we were winning, so, you know, he really had no reason to change like a, 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 a winning strategy. So, you know, and that, that's how the special teams came about. So, all right, the second part of my question is, when you look at sh- the history of Chicago sports, whether it's the next coach taken over for Phil Jackson or the next person to stand in the place of Michael Jordan, you took over for one of the greatest w- running backs in the history of the NFL. The difficulty of that moment how did how did you look at that? You know, because you're listen, man. You're on the 13th all time best list at University of Florida. You've had some incredible accomplishments, but for the guy that's taking over for the guy, right. how did how did that set with you mentally um, in your career? Yeah, well, I don't know if I was, um, you know, just a a good straight thinker. If I was a little cocky, uh, I, I had real serious beliefs in what I could do. You know, and 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 I'm, you know, probably sometimes maybe a little bit too competitive, uh, but that's just that's how God made me. And so, you know, I would kid with certain reporters. They come in and want to know how is it going to be to, you know, fill the shoes of Walter Payton. And my thing is, I think Walter was like a, a size ten, something like that, nine and a half or ten. And I tell him, I mean, I'm a twelve, so. I mean, I have no problem filling his shoes, you know, and I think I can add a little bit because, you know, you got a size 12. I mean, that, 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 that easy feel that she <laughs> overflow it. And, and, um, you know, and, and for me, uh, it was truly, uh, I was really blessed with, with athleticism and, and the God gave me. And so, but what I enjoyed, I think the most is, I know some people it's, it's totally work and, and I get it and there's nothing wrong with it. But for me, I was always just playing a game. Right. I, I was playing a game. Um, 
you know, making good money doing it, but it was, it was a game and, and I really, I just wanted to play and, and to be out there and, and to have those moments, you know, when the teammates are running out there and they grab you and they're picking you up. I mean, that is, that is like, I figured to me, that's, that's life. That's, you can't do anything better uh, for me and, and with the talents that God gave me in life. So, so I really just enjoying that. It, um, it wasn't about, you know, having to be the, the best of all times, you know, that, that kind of stuff was had nothing to do with why I played football or, or, uh, or anything like that. It was just the, the camaraderie, you know. I see guys like uh, I get the chance every now and then to talk to guys like Thomas Sanders, and and then he's <laughs> reminiscing about the things that happened in the locker room, and and I remember some of those things probably more than I remember any of the game. Uh, Geico is a go for the Geico brings you more football stat of the day, and it's all about Neil Anderson, the first round pick in '86 out of Florida. Finished with over 6,000 yards, over 300 catches, and 51 rushing touchdowns, number two in Bears history to Walter Payton. And that record still stands today ahead of Rick Caceres, the late Rick Caceres. So the numbers aside and the way and how hard you played, how much you loved playing and everything you just underscored right there is the love of you from the fans still resonates today. I, I get asked a lot of times, Hey, do you ever talk to Neil Anderson? Whatever, whatever happened to Neil Anderson? So I'm so grateful that you're spending time with us right now. I know you probably keep in touch with, with more than just Thomas Sanders, that group of guys. Um, and I, you know, my first time covering sports was the 85 training camp. I was just a snot nosed kid, didn't know anything, scared to death to talk to guys like Tom Thayer and Dan Hampton and Steve <laughs> McMichael. Uh, but uh, it's just, you are always gracious, always uh, a hard working player. So I think that's why Bears fans, you know, they don't ask for much. I think Tom would right. agree. If you play blue collar football <laughs> and and play for the love of the game, they're going to love you for a lifetime. And that's the unique thing about Chicago Fair, Bears football fan. Would you agree from your experiences? I I would agree totally. And, and I think that opportunity I had to play special teams and then making the most of it the way I did it, I, I think that endeared me with Bears fans forever. Uh, because, I mean, they had a huge respect for this guy is a first-round pick, a running back, and he's supposed to be like a prima donna, but he's getting out there, getting his hands dirty, doing the dirty work, and at that time, you know, knocking people out because, I mean, huh. I, I, you know, I went down sometimes and just laid the wood on people, and, and, and it was just, it was, again, when you got – you know, people that you've seen, you got Richard Dent, you got Mike Singletary, Steve McMichael, these great defenders, Dan Hampton, they're running out there slapping you on the head, picking you up, because you've given them good field position and they can and they can that great defense can get out there and do what they do. And that was that was just great. But the the, the fans from Chicago, they really, really respected me for for you know, taking on that role and, uh, you know, and, and running with it. Uh, you know, let me ask you this because, and Tom can jump in here as well, because you joined a team that had just won a Super Bowl. And so, and that team obviously could have won more. What was your mindset or remember memory about joining what already was the best team that anyone seen running rampant through the National Football League and those near misses to get to the big game and win again. How, what was it like? What was that going into that type of atmosphere? Where everybody, yeah. you guys always expected to win every game. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I told people when I first got drafted, you know, uh, I'm, you know I'm going to Chicago, going to be singing and dancing because they had the Super Bowl shuffle at the time. <laughs> and, 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 you know, some people, they, they would say, man, don't you wish you would have been a part of that? Maybe been a part of that team, but not be a part of the singing and dance. I can't sing or I can't dance. <laughs> right. Either one. You know, I need a, a, like a really, really crowded dance floor. If it's super crowded, <laughs> I mean, I look kind of good because I can keep the beat. You know, I'm on beat, but I can't dance. So, 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 so I would, I, I, and I was going to Chicago and I was a Florida boy and played in Florida in college. And so, 
I'm thinking, I'm thinking, you know, it's going to be a little difficult, you know, it's going to be really cold, but you know, that's just, you know, I think for football players, at least for me, it's just a state of mind. I would come out before a lot of games um, with no, no shirt on right before the game and it's cold, but you know, at that point you're in a different mindset, you know, and, 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 and there was a group of guys that sometimes would have, I think they had like a, a, quite a bit of liquid courage, you know, before the game <laughs> and, and they would stand up when I come out of the locker room and they had N E A L on their chest. And then, then the fifth guy had an exclamation mark and they take their shirts off and, and stuff like that. I mean, that's <laughs> like, that's like living a dream. You know, when, when you're able to, uh, and then you see people, kids, even adults, in the stands with your jersey on, with your name on their back. Mm. That, that's just something that I was so thankful for that, to be in that position. And 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 so, I, I mean, I could never, looking back, I could never have a complaint uh, in the world about if, if you can live that kind of life, even for a little while, I mean, that's that's just great. Neil, give me one story about that offensive line in the locker room, away from the field. We know how dominant, best best offensive line uh, that the, the franchise has certainly ever ever had and the best offensive line uh, that you could possibly imagine in the National Football League. If you want to run the ball and dominate the time of possession, but away from all that, like behind the scenes, because they were a crazy bunch at that five, right? They, uh, they, they were, but, I, I, you know, all of those guys that, that were up there in front, it, it was just hard for me to fathom that, you know, because you expect them to be, I thought, you know, they got to be kind of psychotic. You know, you you get hit in the head like that, you're on the line of scrimmage, defenders just slapping you. But, I mean, at least for me and, and what I saw, they were all just it's gentle giants. I mean, I, I I don't have anything where, you know, I wish I did, but that group, I didn't see anybody just that was really, really, you know, doing anything a little crazy. Well, Mark Boyce was kind of borderline. <laughs> Boyce, Boyce was a little different sometimes, but 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 and me and him, we we got along great. Also, I mean. Um, that that offensive line, I mean, I, you you couldn't have asked for for any, I mean, better as far as the performance and and the people that they were to me. And I know maybe I, I, I was successful and uh, as far as on the field and uh, came in as a first round pick. So you know maybe I see things through through those lenses. Um, you know the only story I have like uh, anything like that. My first day getting into the locker room at training camp. And the first person I meet was Steve McMichael. Oh boy. Oh and boy. It, and I'm on the, um, the, the, the sitting on the table, get my ankles taped because they had a policy to get your ankles taped or get hurt at some kind of fine. Cause I didn't usually get my ankles taped in college, but so I'm on the table and he comes in, he looks at me and he's like, you know, what are you doing? So I, you know, I'm just smiling. I'm always <laughs> smiling. And, and all of a sudden I can tell if he's serious or not. And he get, get, you know, get off the table and, you know, and I guess I was supposed to be there earlier. You know, the rookies, you come in early and the, the vets can come in a little later. Well, I didn't know that. I mean, my first day and I don't think I was liked too much by some people in the beginning because I held out all the training oh, camp. Oh, okay. They get back to Chicago, get back to Lake Forest. There I am. <laughs> they been up in Platteville, Wisconsin, which I didn't understand because I'd never been there before. You know, it's hot. You're up in the middle of those cornfields or whatever, and it's hot. And I didn't go through any of that. Wow. So I, they show back up. I'm just in the locker room smiling. Because I'm always, <laughs> I, I, I smile all the time, you know. And he slaps my foot and is like, get off the table. So I smiled and I laugh. I figure it's a joke. I don't quite understand it, but it's a joke. And then 
it got to the point where I'm thinking, this guy might not be joking. <laughs> and, and, then, and then it got, and it, it could, it, it almost got bad because oh. I mean, I, I, I like it. I don't mind a challenge, you know, and, and I've, always been good with my hands and feet. I mean, you know, through some, you know, martial arts and stuff. And, and I was like, no, this is not, (laughs) this is not going to happen. It's not going to end well. And, but, but, and later when we went up for the, I think it was, what was it? The hundred year, 50 year, what did they? The 100th. Yeah. hundred year. year, We went up there and he's one of the first people because I told my kids that story. And and I I introduced him to him and, and they saw that big person now that he had and 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 everything and um uh so so you know that was something uh oh this is what the NFL is gonna be like but but it wasn't though it was that was just that was just Steve but 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 at in the end uh, he was one of my uh, one of my favorite people to be around because yep. he was just Steve you know. You know, one thing about Neil that really endeared Neil as a teammate to a lot of guys on that team is not only his effort on special teams as a first rounder, and I you talk about how much of the defense loved that and every one of us did, but Neil was also one of the strongest guys in the weight room that we ever had, especially at the running back position. And when he comes in and he's benching nearly 400 pounds, hmm. that's more than a lot of linemen in today's game. So McMichael was that weight room guy, as all of us were with Clyde Emmerich and that. But yeah. Neil is there, and he's putting up uh, you know, strength that we haven't seen out of a running back in the history of the Bears. So that was another you know benchmark of endearment that, you know, you kind of said, you know, set inside that locker room, the commitment to the weight room and everything else that you did, which was a cool yeah. part of you. Yeah. Well, that was fun. And Clyde was, a, Clyde did, did a really good job. And, you know, I got him to help me when I was invited to be on the, the back then it was a superstar competition yep. and, and oh, yeah. they had a superstar competition. And they said, uh, I remember their reporters out there asked me, um, you know, what event you think you'll do best there? And I said, well, I, I don't know. I said, I'm, you know, I get decent speed. I said, but I think I'm going to do the best probably at the weightlifting. And they thought they all laughed because it didn't seem likely. But the weird thing was everybody could be in it, but the finals came down to me and Herschel Walker. Oh, wow. And, and they usually go up like five pounds or whatever. And I think we got to about – 275 and Herschel wanted to go to like 310 and I was like okay well you know I'll try it and he went first and and whatever the number was 350 to 320 he missed it and and I made it and won the superstars weightlifting competition <laughs> from other teams talking about that for 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 a long time so uh but some of that was just you know they call it that just good old country boy strength and 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 God gave me a lot of that, you know. That it gave me a lot of speed and a lot of strength. And I wish I could take, you know, uh, more credit for it. But a lot of that was just uh, I was born with it, and then enhance it a little bit. Yeah, that's a crazy story. Because if I recall, uh, Tom and Neil, uh, Herschel Walker only did push-ups. He wasn't a big yeah. weight room yeah. guy, so yeah, he I, he made I, himself. <laughs> he looked good though. Yeah. You look yeah, good. He did. He did. I say he's, he was no Neil Anderson, though. Hey, Bears fans, Steinhoffels is a proud partner of the Chicago Bears this Bears season. Steinhoffels is partnering with Special Spaces Illinois to create dream bedrooms for children battling cancer. For every false start caused by a Bears defense during a home game, Steinhoffels donates $1,000 to Special Spaces Illinois. Shop in-store and online at steinhoffels.com. And good news, Chicago United Airlines is getting brand new planes with all the bells and whistles like Bluetooth connectivity, screens at every seat and room for everyone's roller bag. United, proud to fly the Chicago Bears and you too. You know, Neil, I, I know that I think you were born in Alabama. How did you end up at Florida and not Alabama? Was it a difficult choice or were you headed to Florida since you were a young kid? Well, I was born the same day that the hospital in my city opened. We never had a hospital in in in, in Graceville, Florida, wow. which is up in the extreme panhandle. Uh, they call it L.A., lower Alabama. Because the closest, nearest, if you went to an airport or a movie theater, you went to Dothan, Alabama. Even though we were in Florida, hmm. that hospital. So I, I was born in Dothan, Alabama, 
And the same day, they brought me back to Graceville because that was a day that our hospital opened. Um, so so I and my family had always been uh, big Alabama fans, and quite a few of them uh, still are, uh, because, you know, that part of Florida kind of was considered kind of Alabama. And so it was, a, it was a tough choice. And Bear Bryant, who at that time, uh, right before he – died, he didn't go out and recruit very much anymore. But he came to my hometown, came to my house, came to the school, and and he recruited me. And that was the hardest thing I had to do uh, at that point in my life was to tell Bear Bryant, you know, for me to call him and tell him that I'm not coming. And, <laughs> and my dad did, did something that was good because I wanted him to do it. Uh, but he said, no, you, you need to you, you need to do this. And I called him and talked to him and, and told him I, I wasn't coming to Alabama. And I, he was the nicest person in the world, said if anything goes wrong, if for any reason you decide to make a change, no matter when it is, it can be this year, next year, uh, you always have, have a place here. And, and I thought that was really, really nice. So I was more of an Alabama fan. But at that time, University of Florida – had never really won anything. They had never won a Southeastern Conference championship. So being a young kid, and I'm thinking, okay, I can do that. I can help win the first SEC championship. And that was the only reason I went to Florida, not because I knew a whole lot about them or I liked them that much. Never really watched Florida football. Hmm. But I thought I could do something a little different. Well, I make a long story short, I get there. And we have some some great players, like, you know, one's Wilbur Marshall. Well, we win in 84 and 85. First one, 84, we won the first SEC championship in Florida history, in U.S. history. Well, they later kind of took that away because of some probation stuff. Uh, we were put on probation. Uh, but we did win that, and that was uh, it's kind of ironic also because this – week on Saturday, University of Florida is going to honor that team for the first time um, because that team was basically stricken from the record books, from everything. It's like, if you were on that team, you didn't exist. They had no recollection, no memory, and which I don't think was quite right because, you know, mistakes are made and everywhere, especially when you got, you know, young 18, 19, 17-year-old kids and, and right. you know, things might be offered to them from, from adults or whatever. And 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 these kids have been walking, right, riding bicycles all their lives, and now they get an opportunity to maybe get a car. You know, I can see, you know, not liking it and, and punishing it, but to just pretend they don't exist is just a little bit of a stretch, in my opinion. But they are going to honor that team. Uh, we played Kentucky this week here at Florida, um, and that's who we won the championship against. We beat Kentucky um, uh, that year, in, uh, 40 years ago. Wow. And so, so they'll honor that team, and, and quite a few of the guys are going to come back, and, and some of okay. them, uh, you know, have passed away, but, uh, but quite a few of them will be here this weekend. Your first career start was against Kentucky, 197 on the ground. How about that for a debut? That, and well, that record was eventually broken by Emmett Smith, who yeah. you know broke Walter's record as well. Weird, yeah. weird symmetry. Exactly. Weird symmetry. Yeah. But yeah, you know, your backfield was insane. All four guys were first round picks. You, yeah. James Jones, Lorenzo Hampton, John L. Williams, Tommy. Yeah. You remember all those? Guys? I mean, yeah, a that's as good. Came out my year. That's as good as a group as you can get. Yeah, and yep. then to have defenders like Alonzo Johnson, one of the best linebackers, he he, he recently died, and then Wilbur Marshall, mm. one of the great linebackers. I mean, and then, and to me, even more importantly, on that team in '84, we had what was known as the Great Wall of Florida. I mean, we had a line that was just unbelievable. I mean, you had some guys. Uh, that could play, and and probably the most notable one from that team, you know, uh, ended up being Lomas Brown. Oh yeah, our good buddy but, Lomas. Yep. Oh man, love him. This guy, yeah. And so, hmm. I mean, he was there, you know. Doing, so that team, you know, in our opinion, with, with you know, the other teams have won national championships at the University of Florida, but 
we think if that team, those teams line up with our team, we like our chances. Yeah, I'd say. Oh, yeah. I'd say. I mean, I, I don't play anymore, but we, I, I, I would like my chances. I know one thing. One time Neil brought in boiled peanuts into the locker room. I didn't like them then, and I still don't like them. <laughs> and I was amazed because he was introducing us to something I've never even heard of before. And I use the hard shell peanuts at different restaurants and stuff you've gone to. But his entrepreneurship is amazing because he always had his sights set in a proper direction. And I think that he could give a lot of advice to younger players of today. And it would be as as important as it is in the outcome of Neil's uh, future in his life. Well, I tell you you what, uh, again, I, I I was blessed from from the very beginning, um, you know, uh, having a great family, had my mom and dad there. Uh, we didn't we didn't have much, um, and we were really really poor. And and but they were so good, my parents. I didn't know it hmm. because I had everything I needed, whatever shoes I needed for whatever sport that was going on. They went into more debt, making sure I had what I needed. And so, because I had what I what I needed, I thought we were kind of middle class. Wow. Well, I got older, and I realized, I mean, we're poor. We're real poor. And 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 I had told uh, my parents, I said, look, you know, you will not have to pay or even help with college. Because now, um, part of the reason I say that is because there were some weights. That at the time I wanted to get, they were from uh, I forget maybe Sears I think at the time was the name of the store, and I wanted this set of weights, and so I told my mom and dad said, yeah, if, if we get if I get these, I'm gonna work out, I'm gonna I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get a scholarship, you won't have to pay for college anything, and and I got it, but you know, uh, but that worked that worked out, you know, it it, it came to fruition, and I I didn't have to. Didn't have to do that kind of stuff, but but you know um, it, it was great having having parents like that 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 trusted you that that believed in you, um, you know. But I, I knew that you know nobody would want to choose to be poor, and and if I had an opportunity to to uh, to do something different, and I wasn't taught a whole lot of my finances and investing as a kid because we didn't have money to invest. We had money to pay bills. Mm. So, so I didn't learn that kind of stuff, but to me, a lot of it came down to common sense. You know, um, if, if you're making a decent income and you can, you know, put yourself on a budget and you can kind of live that lifestyle, which it wasn't, a poor man's lifestyle. I mean, I didn't have like a mansion, but I had a town home and I didn't, I didn't like, uh, I think I was kind of fortunate because I didn't like a lot of fancy things. It wasn't, you know, having the three of the most expensive cars in the world wasn't for me. I mean, I don't really like to keep cars clean. So I just like to have a <laughs> car to get me from, you know, from where, I, get me to where I need to go. And so, so a little bit, I think, was just just being fortunate, you know, uh, growing up the way I grew up, and and so, and and so, uh, I think when I did get an opportunity to to make a little money, um, you know, I wanted to take care of it and, and and be able to help my family out. Why peanuts? Well, that's a good question <laughs> because, because I, I I knew a gentleman that he had a peanut farm and he got uh went through a little difficulty at a, a time and uh because he had put some money in the watermelon and watermelons are, are very iffy and dependent on the weather and stuff and the rain and and he went through a divorce at the same time and 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 so we kind of backed into it i say we myself and my attorney um uh, but my father worked at Gold Kiss Peanuts all his his adult life mostly. He he was there uh, in my hometown at a peanut meal, so I knew a little bit about him. But uh, we kind of just kind of baked into that that we we helped help someone out uh, that that needed a hand and ended up 
you know, taken over it. And uh, for a long time, it was it was very successful. Now it has since been sold, and, and uh, we don't we don't not doing that anymore. But uh, that was a, a, a great investment uh, at the time, and it worked out really really well. But Tom is right; I didn't know because you grew up in in Florida and in the South. Boy, peanuts! You just think that everybody eats them. <laughs> you know, and that's, I just thought everybody. And I, and I was doing, like, I thought being really nice and had so many of them sent up to Chicago. And then looking at these guys, they're looking at them like, <laughs> like it's like an alien or something. And I never knew that they wasn't used to it because the boiled peanuts look a little wet. And, and, and it's like, <laughs> and when you think about it, it's totally different. But I just, I knew that everybody, I thought everybody in the world ate boiled peanuts because in Florida and the way I was from, you ate boiled, you just boiled right. peanuts with just a, a staple. And I mean, these guys, some of them just, they sitting around just looking at them and, and some would not even taste them. You know, they didn't know if they liked them or not because, and, and, and I, so I was, you know, you just never know. This is the big, a big world. And, and, and because again, I, to me, it was, just human. You boiled peanuts was just a part of life, you know, and and you're probably gonna like it if you tried it. <laughs> Tom Stewart, and he won't eat tomatoes either. So you know, it's not just peanuts. Okay. If we're on the team yeah. playing and there's tomatoes, he gives them to me. I love uh, tomatoes. Anyway, <laughs> taste like Miller time. Go to millerlightcom slash pod to find delivery options near you. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 96 calories and 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. We're running out of time, but also the you started the first uh, community bank and trust down there. Uh, are you still a part of that, or are you completely retired? And you got to tell us quickly about your tennis life because, you know, going from football, being a rugged running back, to tennis – as a as a senior sport for you um, is pretty cool story. So hit those well, real quick. I tell you, I'm co- completely retired from the banking. Uh, we we had a great run, did well, and uh, ended up uh, being bought out by by a really large bank. So uh, it, it worked out worked out great. And then as far as the tennis goes, uh, I had a goal, and and five point was a pretty you know high level player, and that's what I wanted to become. And I was told. Well, you're starting too late in life, so it's not going to work. But I became a 5.0 tennis player, and I quit the next month. Only what? Cause I, had, I played one more month because I promised a guy I was playing in a tournament with it. And I did that tournament, and and I, had, I haven't played since then. Wow. But now I love pickleball. Oh, I, here we go. I play I'm a, surprised. I play a lot of pickleball and, uh, and still play golf. I mean, the handicap probably, I don't know, four or five, somewhere in there. Uh, so, but, but pickleball is a, it, it's a great, it's a great game. Well, that's a professional sport now too. And so, you know, you seem like a very goal oriented individual yeah. reach the goal, then move on to the next one. So do you have aspirations of being a pickleball King somewhere? No, I, I like pickleball. Just, I don't like to travel that much. Cause you know, to play a lot of tournaments, you got to get on the road and travel and go. And, and live out of your suitcase. And, and I don't like that aspect, of, but I, I just enjoy, you know, just having fun playing pickleball and, and, and driving my golf cart over to the club here and, 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 and playing. So just kind of low key, but, I, but I'm a pretty decent player. No, I mean, listen, I, I'm so inspired by Neil. He, he um, exactly. you know, the way he endeared himself in one of the most dis- difficult positions in professional sport coming in and, you know, being able to, provide a spark to his own football life, take over for Walter Payton, have a successful sports career, a successful business life. I just, I don't you know, forget I'm the great, the, don't forget the great dad part. Right. Neil, that's what I'm saying. I'm in the Neil Anderson, Charlie Neil Anderson admiration club. All right. So. I forgot somebody remind me. Why was your nickname? Charlie? Nope. But my that's real his name, is Charlie Neil Anderson did uh, not know that. Yep. Uncle who was also Charlie. So they called me Neil and and the Neil stuck, but I knew when people were close to me because the, the the Bears would come to Tampa and we play, and all of a sudden I'd hear this Southern accent, and because the people just saying Neil because they're, they're fans and that's great, but all of a sudden I'd hear this Charlie Neil Anderson, and I knew <laughs> you're this home. Is somebody from home. This is somebody from home. They they've come here, 
I'm back. So you know, real quick, you always knew when Ditka really, really liked you when he would call William Perry Bill. He yeah. would call Neil Charlie. Yeah. And I think that was like over the hump of the Ditka respect. He's not going to hug you, pat you on the back, give you kisses. But yeah. if he calls you by your real name, you know yeah. that he's done a little investigative work. Yeah. And that That's not his style to do all the hugging and kissing. And right. All. But, yeah, there's certain things, little things that you can pick up on him that uh, he wasn't as tough as he tried to pretend he was. <laughs> Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Illinois right here at home, driving access toward healthier communities through it all. And again, Bears fan Steinhoffels is a proud partner of the Chicago Bears. This Bears season, Steinhoffels is partnering with Special Spaces Illinois to create dream bedrooms for children battling cancer for every false start caused by Bears defense during a home game. Steinhoffels donates $1,000 to Special Spaces Illinois. Shop in-store and online at steinhoffels.com. Here's a what-if to wrap this up. And just 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 work with me, Neil. Work with okay. me. Much respect. Yeah. So just looking at your math and looking at your dominance, and you had, obviously, a great offensive line and a great football team, great players around you. It'd be if, if you would have stayed four more years, say, had a 12-year career, and your numbers were tracking towards what they were at an era when, you know, teams ran the ball a lot, do you think you would have been considered for a Hall of Fame career? Yeah, that's tough. I think, I think if that had... I, and it may have been crazy, but I think if that had been my goal, yeah, I think I could have. Uh, uh, that was never, ever uh, had anything to do with um, why I played or, or how I played. Uh, now, you know, because I know, like, Emmitt Smith, that was his goal from day one. Mm-hmm. He wanted to be a Hall of Fame. He wanted to be the leading rusher in the history of the game. That's what he told me. And, and, and it worked out. But that was that was never what I wanted to do. I just like to play and, and, and ha- have fun. Well, you certainly did, and we appreciate it. We were the benefactors of your performances. So thank you so much for all this. This was beyond my expectations. Learned a lot, yep. and I love that ever everlasting smile on your face. Thank, so Thank uh, you for having me on. I appreciate yeah, it. I really appreciate it, man. Thanks for taking the time. You are more than awesome as a older guy than you were as a player. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I appreciate and, and, it. And every now and again, tune us in. Every now, tune us in on the radio. Uh, the Bears are coming, man, and we got this quarterback, Caleb Williams. So take a peek. He's looking good. Yeah, He's right. Good and the team's looking good. So, so I'm very proud of him. All right, Neil. Special thanks to you. And for Tom, I'm Jeff. Thanks for listening, everybody. Please subscribe now. The Chicago Bears official app, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. Bear down, everybody.